In the 1970s, while much of the world focused on training harder, the Soviet Union was developing something different, a systematic approach to recovery. Their athletes were achieving remarkable results, breaking records, and dominating international competitions. And while genetics and state-sponsored programs played their roles, there was also a sophisticated system at work. The Soviets didn't just train the body. They studied it, measured it, and optimized it. They viewed recovery not as passive rest, but as an active component of training. Their methods were built on years of research, and many of their principles are now standard practice worldwide. Western training programs often emphasized volume and intensity. Lift heavier, train longer, push harder. But in the Soviet Union, training was mapped systematically. Training, eating, sleeping, all were considered variables to be controlled and optimized. Coaches tracked heart rate, body temperature, muscle soreness, and grip strength using simple tools and notebooks long before modern recovery technology existed. They discovered something that would reshape sports science. If you could control recovery, you could train more frequently, progress faster, and extend athletic careers. The West often chased maximum intensity. The Soviets pursued sustainable progression. Soviet sports scientists identified three pillars of recovery. Physiological recovery, psychological recovery, neurological recovery. Each was treated as a separate training component, as important as the lifting itself. Where Western programs often viewed rest as the absence of training, Soviet coaches made it an active process. Every recovery method was planned, measured, and scheduled. At the center of their philosophy was one principle, adaptation. The body doesn't grow during training. It grows between training sessions. The Soviets sought to maximize that adaptation window. One of their most widely used recovery tools was contrast therapy, alternating between heat and cold. For centuries, Russian culture had embraced the banya, traditional steam baths, followed by cold plunges in snow or icy rivers. Soviet sports scientists systematized this traditional practice. Athletes had access to saunas and cold water immersion. The principle was straightforward. Heat causes blood vessels to dilate, increasing circulation and helping flush metabolic waste from muscle tissue. Cold immersion then constricts the vessels, creating a pumping effect. This cycle of expansion and contraction accelerated recovery beyond passive rest alone athletes would rotate between heat and cold. The process reduced inflammation, improved sleep quality, and aided hormonal balance. This wasn't viewed as luxury or comfort. It was functional recovery methodology. After contrast, therapy came massage. Systematic, scheduled, and methodical. Soviet sports massage was performed by trained physiotherapists who worked within Olympic facilities full-time, treating athletes daily. Each session was timed according to the training schedule. Light massage before training to stimulate the nervous system and deeper work after training to aid recovery and restore tissue elasticity. Soviet sports science produced extensive literature on massage methodology. Every technique, every pressure point, every duration was documented and standardized. Western athletes often viewed massage as a luxury or occasional treatment. Soviet coaches saw it as essential maintenance, regular upkeep to keep athletes functioning optimally. Soviet coaches understood something that seems obvious today, but was revolutionary then. Sleep is when the body rebuilds. They tracked their athletes' sleep patterns. When sleep quality declined, training volume was reduced accordingly. Some training facilities had dedicated recovery rooms, quiet spaces where athletes could rest between sessions to recharge their nervous systems. The principle was clear. Fatigue degrades performance and blocks adaptation. Sleep was the primary countermeasure. On designated recovery days, Soviet athletes didn't simply rest. They engaged in what was called active restoration training. Light movement designed to facilitate recovery without adding fatigue. This could include calisthenics, swimming, or rhythmic exercises. The goal wasn't to challenge the body, but to maintain movement. 
They believed that light activity improved nutrient delivery and accelerated tissue repair. For example, after a heavy squat session, an athlete might perform 30 minutes of light jump rope, dynamic stretching, or controlled kettlebell work the following day. Their principle, blood flow aids recovery. Keep the blood moving without taxing the system. Modern research supports this approach. Light aerobic activity can improve capillary density and reduce soreness. Most lifters think recovery is primarily about muscle soreness. Soviet coaches understood that recovery is neurological. The nervous system determines how much strength you can express, how much fatigue accumulates, and how long you can sustain progress. This is why Soviet training programs generally avoided training to muscular failure. They believed that grinding out repetitions to complete exhaustion burned out the central nervous system, delaying recovery for days. Instead, their athletes typically stopped two or three repetitions before failure. Every repetition was performed with good technique. Every set remained controlled. This approach allowed them to train multiple times per day without breaking down. They weren't just fatiguing muscle, they were educating the nervous system. To them, recovery wasn't an afterthought. It was integrated into the training methodology itself. While some Western athletes experimented with early supplements, Soviet athletes relied primarily on whole food and strategic timing. Meals were designed to support recovery and performance. Each athlete's intake was monitored and logged. They prioritized protein from eggs, fish, and meat. Complex carbohydrates from potatoes, grains, and rye bread. Fats from dairy and seeds for hormonal support. Their approach to meal timing was systematic. Post-training meals were consumed promptly after each session, what they understood as the window when nutrients could be most effectively utilized. Soviet research also explored adaptogenic herbs. In sealed laboratories in Siberia during the 1970s, Ministry of Defense scientists tested traditional plants like rhodiola, eleuthero, Siberian ginseng, and schisandra berries. They were searching for natural substances that could help soldiers endure extreme conditions and found that these adaptogens improved stress resistance and endurance without the crash or addiction of stimulants. Rhodiola became particularly valued. Studies showed it helped athletes maintain focus under fatigue. Soviet biathletes reportedly could shoot more accurately even when physically exhausted. These compounds would later inspire Western interest in nootropics and natural performance enhancers but the Soviets had been researching them secretly for decades. Their nutrition philosophy wasn't elaborate. It was functional and systematic. Physical recovery was only part of the equation. Soviet sports scientists recognized that psychological fatigue could be as limiting as physical exhaustion. Elite athletes had access to sports psychologists. Mental preparation was considered essential training. Sessions included visualization techniques and stress reduction methods. Athletes were trained to enter relaxed states on command. One Soviet psychologist explained it this way, the body cannot relax if the mind remains tense. Athletes used visualization not just for performance but for recovery, imagining their muscles healing, adapting, and growing stronger. Western sports programs initially dismissed psychological training. Today, Sports psychology and mindfulness are fundamental recovery tools in elite athletics. What's remarkable is that the Soviets implemented all of this without modern technology. No fitness trackers, no heart rate variability monitors, no recovery apps. Coaches used notebooks, tracking daily pulse, subjective mood ratings, sleep quality, and grip strength. If an athlete's morning resting pulse was elevated beyond their baseline, training load was adjusted. They created a feedback loop between athlete and coach long before biofeedback became a mainstream concept. In Western programs, overtraining was often seen as an athlete's failure to push through. In Soviet programs, it was treated as valuable data, a signal to adjust the system. Their approach was both systematic and adaptable following principles while responding to individual variation. Ice baths weren't optional in Soviet training facilities. 
they were protocol. After heavy training sessions, athletes would immerse themselves in cold water, typically around 10 degrees Celsius for several minutes. Cold exposure wasn't just for managing soreness. They understood it helped regulate stress hormones, particularly cortisol, and supported nervous system recovery. The practice of using extreme cold for recovery has deep roots in Russian culture and was systematized by Soviet sports scientists into training protocols. The real foundation behind all Soviet recovery methods was control. The Soviets controlled every variable they could, from sleep timing to cold exposure temperature. Everything was logged, analyzed, and refined. To them, recovery wasn't passive, it was a skill. It was discipline, it was science. They viewed the human body as a complex system, capable of remarkable performance when managed with precision. And in that precision, they found the capacity for consistent long-term development. For everyday athletes and lifters, the Soviet approach offers several lessons. One, treat recovery as training. If you're not recovering, you're not adapting, rest isn't laziness. It's where growth happens. Two, use temperature strategically. Contrast therapy, whether sauna and cold shower or hot bath and cold exposure, can improve circulation and accelerate recovery. Three, incorporate movement on rest days, walking, mobility work, light activity, keeping blood flowing aids recovery without adding fatigue. Four, protect your nervous system. Avoid constantly training to failure. Leaving repetitions in reserve allows for more frequent training and longer term progress. Five, prioritize sleep. Eight to 10 hours isn't excessive for serious training. It's optimal for recovery. Six, train your mind. Meditation, breathing exercises, visualization. Mental recovery supports physical recovery. Seven, be systematic. The Soviets didn't chase shortcuts. They built consistent, repeatable systems and trusted the process. When the Soviet Union dissolved, Soviet sports science spread globally. Western coaches were struck not just by how Soviet athletes trained, but by how they recovered. Their system changed everything. Periodization theory, deload protocols, recovery blocks, fatigue monitoring, and management. All of these concepts began in Soviet training facilities, where athletes trained not for individual glory, but as representatives of their nation. While the Soviet Union no longer exists, its methodology lives on in virtually every elite training program today. The fundamental truth they discovered remains valid. You don't get stronger by training harder. You get stronger by recovering smarter.